Apex Express, Asian Pacific Expression. Community and cultural coverage. Music and calendar. New visions and voices. Coming to you with an Asian Pacific Islander point of view. It's time to get on board the Apex Express. Tonight on Apex Express, we talk about the city of Oakland's climate action plan. And we have organizers with the Oakland Climate Action Coalition joining us to talk about their efforts to impact Oakland's climate action plan policy. Also, a report back and film reviews from the SF International Asian American Film Festival. And we honor the late great filmmaker and community organizer, Lonnie Ding. I'm your host for the evening, Ellen Choi. And also joining us later in the show is Annabelle Udo O'Malley, Matthew Abaya, and DJ Breda Kay. Um, first, I just wanted to give an announcement about um, a pair of tickets that we have to a Yoshi show in San Francisco. We have Najee. We have a pair of tickets. He's going to be at um, Yoshi's Thursday through Saturday, March 25th through the 27th, though has been there. Um, we have a ticket for this Friday's 10 p.m. show. So if you're interested in those tickets, give us a call at 510-848-4425. So we're going to go ahead and jump into our segment about with the Oakland Climate Action Coalition. And we're starting um, by speaking with some incredible organizers who have been working hard right here in Oakland. They're representing local organizations that are a part of the Oakland Climate Action Coalition. And this is an amazing coalition that I've personally also had the honor of working with recently um, that's brought a deep cross-section of businesses, community groups, organized labor groups, youth, and just everyday Oakland residents together to create an equitable and just energy and climate action plan for the city of Oakland. And we'll talk more in depth about what that plan is and what it really means for Oakland in tonight's interview. First, I want to introduce our guests. We have Dana Paredes. She is the organizing director with the with Asian Communities for Reproductive Justice. She's been with the organization since February of 03, so for seven years. And Dana has worked actually with social justice organizations for the past, for over 12 years as a trainer, national program director and organizer. Um, Dana is also a fellow with the Women's Policy Institute and serves on the advisory committee for Spirit in Motion and Asian Community Training. Also with us is Ian Kim. He is the campaign director for the Green Collar Jobs Campaign at the Ella Baker Center for Human Rights. Um, <clears throat> this campaign is... Um, runs cutting-edge solutions-driven campaigns for justice, peace, and opportunities in our cities. And the Green Collar Jobs Campaign is nationally renowned, working to leverage the explosive growth of new green economy to create meaningful career opportunities for poor people and people of color. They work nationally and statewide, um, but right here in Oakland, the campaign anchors a multi-sector coalition called the Oakland Apollo Alliance and also spearheads the Oakland Green Jobs Corps. And a quick shout out to Emily Kirsch of the Green jo Collar Jobs Campaign, who works with Ian. And she's done a lot of amazing work to convene the Oakland Cl Climate Action Coalition itself. Um, so why don't we go ahead and jump into our interview. Um, and I just want to make a note that they're here tonight, especially because of an important moment for this coalition and um, for the city of Oakland since this t next Tuesday, the 30th. The City of Oakland City Council will be uh, presenting their climate action plan proposal and the coalition itself is holding a rally right before the meeting and um, that's this Tuesday the 30th and we'll have more information in a little while. So let's just get started and giving us a little bit of a history context, Ian, if you don't mind, can you just first explain what this coalition is, how it was brought together and why? Sure. Um, and first of all, Ellen, thank you so much for having us on the show. It's um, wonderful to have a chance to share a conversation with you and with Dana. So this is going to be fun. Um, so 
The the city of Oakland's public works agency announced over a year ago that they were going to put together an energy and climate action plan for the whole city of Oakland. Um, we're fortunate that within the city of Oakland's government, within the public works agency, there are some uh, good there are some good people who are concerned about climate change and want Oakland to to uh, to be a leader in the pack of cities that's tackling glo- global warming and climate change. So at the Ella Baker Center, when we heard that there was going to be an energy and climate action plan, something that had to be passed by city council, uh, we knew that we needed to get involved. We've been working for years on advocacy for green jobs and green pathways out of poverty. We knew that um, just as at the state level and the national level, um, local policy on uh, tackling global warming is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to define the way uh, we work, the way we live, the way we educate each other. So, um, and we knew also that we didn't want to do it by ourselves, that we couldn't do it by ourselves, that we needed to take a coalition approach. And so uh, a little over a year ago, we called for an Oakland Climate Action Coalition. And what's been really amazing is to see the the vibrancy and the number and the diversity of organizations and leaders from many different places in Oakland that have come together um, and who who really understand the importance of this moment in defining Oakland's Oakland's future. So I think that we are breaking the mold. I think we're breaking the mold on what climate policy can look like from a city level. We're breaking the mold on who participates and influencing that policy. So um, we are, uh, you know, a coalition that's full of grassroots organizations that has labor unions and green businesses that has environmentalists. You know, we have, um, we have scientists and geeks. We also have teachers and parents and everyday people in the coalition. So um, that's kind of who we are. And uh, it's been an incredible amount of work for the last year and the work continues. But I'll stop there um, at, at the risk of talking too long, and maybe you can ask more questions to get to the, the meat of the information. I definitely will. Um, and that's really great that you mentioned the cross-section of folks who are at the table right now, because um, I've just been really interested in the past year about how we make this issue of climate change relevant to our communities and to our everyday lives. And um, seeing climate change as a very broad issue that's not just environmental, it's not just science and technical, um, I think is really important. And seeing it as something that's actually really affecting our lives and our health. Um, But sometimes it's hard to translate that through all the jargon that's going around. So I want to switch over to Dana and see if, um, could you just explain a little bit more about through your work, how um, do you see climate change? What does it mean for Oakland residents? And what kind of impacts are you seeing, especially in low-income API communities? Yeah, um, similar to kind of what's already been mentioned, um, at Asian Communities for Reproductive Justice, we started um, having conversations with um, the young women um, and Asian workers that we work with um, about climate change and started to, to draw make the connections um, with the issues that we were working on around youth engagement and empowerment and um, workers' health and safety. And as we were um, having these conversations um, with our constituencies, we were super excited to make connections with other organizations through the Climate Action Coalition um, to come together to see what we could all do as a diverse set of organizations um, with a diverse set of experiences and interests about what we um, hope the city to become um, at the at the end of this first phase. So um, for us, you know, talking about climate change um, is not always in a straight path. Um, we often have to um, talk a little bit about the science of it um, and talk about kind of why should we do something now when, you know, we're not looking at impacts that are uh, 10 and 20 years down the line. And um, those conversations aren't always easy, but what um, is shared amongst um, the young people and the workers um, that we talk to is that people are anxious to figure out what they can do right now. And people are looking to organizations um, like the Ella Baker Center and like Asian Communities for Reproductive Justice to find some direction on how they can start to transition their lives and think about the different choices um, that they have that they can make right now. So for young people, um, some of the conversations have um, connected 
uh, climate change with the kind of jobs that their families have right now. Um, some of them have family members that are in um, the kind of green uh, academies and green uh, tech programs that are currently um, popping up all over the place in our city. Um, they also talk about access to public transportation, um, and they talk about what green could look like at every day in their schools. Um, and most importantly, what they're really concerned about is they see climate change as the issue of their generation. They see themselves having to deal with the decisions that adults are making right now for a much longer period of time. Um, so young people are going to have to deal with those consequences longer than the adults who are uh, making these decisions right now. And so they're really anxious to figure out where they can have space to get involved, um, to have to have an impact on uh, and influence um, these uh, decisions and key moments like right now. And the Asian workers that, um, that we talked to, um, who are mostly in very small, um, kind of uh, owned, uh, small owned and operated businesses, um, where they, you know, largely employ other family members, um, are looking for um, ways to have supports so that they can green their own businesses. And um, so we don't work with all Asian workers um, who run their own businesses in the city of Oakland. Um, but a lot of the people that we do work with um, live in Oakland. They employ people who live and work in Oakland. And everybody is trying to figure out how the city is also going to support them to transition their businesses to become more green so that together we can um, actually all be part of the solutions um, to lowering the city's um, carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. So right now then, we are in a moment where we're seeing, um, waiting to see how the city is supporting the community in that way um, and on this issue of climate change. And so how is the coalition then tra translating those impacts into policy? Um, how are you, what, what are your priorities that you're presenting to, to city council and to the city of Oakland? Great. Well, um, Actually, I want to say a little bit about the broad range of work that we're doing as a coalition. Mm -hmm. We have, um, how many is it, Dana? 35 or so organizations from across the board who are participating in a really active way. Yes. And um, one of the first things that we did was uh, identify what our goals were within the Energy and Climate Action Plan. So we know that as a group and as a city that through this ECAP, as it's called, we want to clean up air pollution. We want to create jobs. We want to save money for residents who are going to feel the impact of an increasing cost of living because of the impacts of climate change. And we want to improve public health. So this is, you know, the, what we are up to as a group and as a city is more than just about reducing, you know, parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This is really, it's, it's much farther reaching than that. We understand that the issue of climate change d reaches deeply into our everyday lives. So, um... We came up with, uh, you know, our, some principles together as a group, our goals together as a group, and uh, went even farther in recommending very specific policy solutions coming that come from the wisdom of our, our concrete experiences on the ground as people who live in Oakland, as people who are on the front lines, as people who are working with and are the, the low-income and vulnerable people who will be hit first and worst by the impacts of climate change. So... Um, uh, so those those policy recommendations are really the the core of what we're fighting for, and the way that we're doing that is through a lot of community engagement, a lot of mass public education, and um, and I think and I hope a lot of smart policy advocacy at the city council level. So we did uh, a range of neighborhood workshops in low income communities throughout Oakland, and we had a climate uh, community convergence for climate action late in the year in 2009 where over 400 people came out. Um, you, you imagine like a weekday evening and 400 people came out for three hours to, to eat tacos with us and talk mm -hmm. about climate change. And it was an exceedingly diverse group of people, uh, multiracial, intergenerational from all places in the city. Um, that's remarkable to me. So, um, so uh, we, uh, we helped the city council to take its first step last year, which was to um, set numerical targets for energy and climate reductions and Oakland has as far as we know the most aggressive targets of any city in the country um, by the numbers uh, we're saying Oakland is Oakland City Council has already decided by the year 2020 
will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions in the whole city 36% below 2005 levels. Um, that's a lot. And then by 2050, 85% below 2005 levels. That's also a lot. So um, the next step is really, though, what's important. The next step is city council will decide how to reach those targets. And the way that we do this really matters. And that's where the policy recommendations that we've come up with as a group that are about creating a thriving green economy, that are about protecting vulnerable people and making sure that we all benefit broadly from the protections and, and, the, and the opportunities that come from these solutions, um, that that's part of that. That's what we're up to. So uh, I hope that answers your question. Uh, yeah. I talked for a while. Most definitely. And I remember being at the Convergence and really just being so impressed and just so inspired by really believing that, oh, this is actually what Oakland looks like. And it's such a beautiful thing to see them at a climate convergence. <laughs> so um, major props to the organizing committee who threw that event. And um, so... So can you explain then what's happening on Tuesday and how is, like, literally, how has the coalition um, been talking to the city? Um, yeah, what's that process been like? Yeah, I mean, it's been um, pretty remarkable. Um, we have continued to um, bring folks from the community together to get ready for this rally that's coming up on Tuesday, March 30th um, in City Hall. Um, and... You know, it's, you know, coming, having been really involved in the community co convergence that happened um, last fall and also being really involved in um, getting ready for this big rally that's happening next week, um, it has been a uh, pretty darn amazing to um, be, po be part of this pretty dynamic demonstration of democracy. Um, there's nothing really coming to vote right now, but people are constantly looking for community spaces and places to let their voices be heard. And this rally next week is um, going to be a pivotal place for that to happen as well. Um, we are going to be hosting um, a rally again right out in front of City Hall in Frank Ogawa Plaza at 4.30 um, next Tuesday. Um, shortly thereafter, City Council will be meeting to get um, kind of a first presentation of what uh, the Public Works Department has um, come up with as a plan to get us to the um, to the goals that Ian had mentioned of um, thirty six percent reduction rates um, below two thousand five levels. So um, we're super excited for folks to turn out for this rally, uh, rain or shine. Um, we're going to be out there um, in mass and really looking forward to um, people coming out um, maybe for the first time. Um, it will be their chance to come out to support uh, climate justice and to support the Cl Oakland Climate Action Coalition um, or maybe to follow up their involvement um, that has started last fall. Mm -hmm. And um, so can you give us a little preview of some of the program details that we're going to be able to see at this rally? I know we're going to have some amazing music going on. Yeah, we're going to um, ha have amazing music going on. <laughs> we're also going to um, be welcoming a performance um, by Ashel, mm -hmm. um, who's going to be um, leading a song um, specifically around uh, climate justice. Um, of course, there's going to be a lot of uh, chanting and rallying. Um, we are also looking forward to um, hearing and seeing um, our representatives in City Hall. Um, so we're still shoring up the lineup, um, but we've gotten some pretty um, welcoming response from uh, City Council members and from the mayor's office about um, coming out to show their support for the work of the coalition and for the work that's about to uh, take place in the city of Oakland. Great. So... Um that's actually a perfect segue into some music that we have um, to play for y'all, which is from Shell Seasons, who is the artist who's going to be performing at uh, the rally on March 30th. And just a little um, intro into this song. He's actually coming out with a whole album on Earth Day, April 22nd, called Earth Amplified. This track is called Global Warning, which is by artists J. Bless, Ashell Seasons, and Stickman from the famous group Dead Prez. 
and um, just a little bit about the album that it covers issues about food and water security, climate justice, poverty, prisons, and the possibility of global transformation. And I think it's just amazing to hear a hip hop album that is targeted around such amazing issues and that are important to our communities. So we'll go ahead and play the track Global Warning. <laughs> Where the bell out for this? Swim out the metropolis. Cause ice get melt like sun kissed Icarus. Well, they chatted, dried in Baghdad. Yo, your numbers don't add. Just the greenhouse gas. Appalachian coal mine. A fisherman in Bangladesh. Uncle Sam making bets. Write his name by the Exxon Valdez. Probably asthma's next. Little Johnny got a little funny knob in his neck. So what's the problem with that? You just a corporate exec would extract that oil from the boils of the backs of Nigerians. Give me that. Pass out texts like refs through the Mavericks. Offset politics. Copenhagen, no debate, and need the reparations. And why you waiting another 600 acres gone in the Congo and Amazon by the end of the song? On it, on it, we so on it. Gotta be on it. If we ain't on it, we's a corner. Who, me, you, everyone in their mama. It's some world so defending it with honor. On it. On it, we so on it, gotta be on it, if you ain't on it, it's a warning. Take a look at the world around, cause the temperature is rising, the time is now. Out in July, right? Feel the sunlight, but it's only April, something don't feel right. Yeah, it's true, we all live under the sun, but what we do, we got us all living under the gun. Cause the science is real, but the politics are dominant. Without action, the outlook is ominous. But on the nuts, the government's the lobbyists, and they get that dough to keep the stack quo. Freeze that cash flow, it's course the natural. Pale white horse coming directly at you. Took a whole lot of troops to top of the statue. But just one Katrina put a tree in your bathroom. Cause we don't live in a vacuum. Things you put out in the world will come back and get at you like a... Boomerang don't care who threw it How you gon' explain to a hurricane that you ain't do it On it, on it, we so on it Gotta be on it, if we ain't on it, we a corner Who, me, you, everyone in their mama It's our world, so defending it with honor On it, on it, we so on it Gotta be on it, if you ain't on it, it's a warning Take a look at the world around The temperature is rising, the time is now Go green, go solar, go agriculture Five burn McDonald's and Coca-Cola All corporate vultures should burn in the toxic sulfur They admit for every dollar they get They exploit the culture and take resources Control the media and censor the voice of the voiceless Sitting back fat in their office They don't see people just profits and losses They don't give a damn about the trees or the dolphins You green if you don't know it's the greed for the fortune Even the green movement better be cautious Funded by the corporate machine when the interest This is crossing. We can't depend on the Congress. Need a grassroots movement to raise the conscious, to engage the masses with seeds of knowledge. Get our fingers in the dirt so we can reap the harvest. The seed wanna grow, but it's deep in darkness. The hood gotta learn how to turn the garbage into healthy soil. We can help the world, but we running out of time like they running out of oil. Great. Welcome back. You're here uh, at Apex Express, and I'm Ellen Choi, and I'm here interviewing some folks from the Oakland Climate Action Coalition. And um, we've been talking about Oakland's Climate Action Plan, which is being proposed at the City Council meeting this Tuesday. Um, so I was hoping that we can get a little bit um, more specific with the plan, and um, so folks can really understand how this is going to impact us and what we can see. Ian, can you provide some specific solutions that we're going to possibly, hopefully, see with this plan? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you know, the if you uh, if you talk with the city staff, like Garrett Fitzgerald at at City of Oakland, um, and if you talk to the city council members who are really gung ho about this. 
uh, like Jane Bruner and Nancy Nadell and Rebecca Kaplan and others, um, then you'll know that actually talking about an energy and climate action plan um, reaches into a lot of different areas. So just to read the laundry list of, of the categories, we're talking about transportation and land use. We're talking about building ener- the, the energy and water efficiency of our buildings and the renewable energy associated with that. We're talking about consumption and solid waste. And we're talking about the adaptation that's required because we know sea level rise is already going to happen. We know that by the end of this century, we're going to see a one to three meter rise in sea level, which means that a lot of the, the areas that are, that are close to the water throughout the bay um, are going to be underwater unless we do something about that. So, um, so you know, there's, there's, there's really a lot to take in. And in each of those categories, I think there are really inspiring solutions that we know um, you know that that we know actually can transform the way that we that we lead our daily lives. Yeah, just you know, and at, at the Ella Baker Center, since we work on on green collar jobs advocacy, um, we're we're really concerned about the economic opportunity, the job creation opportunity, the wealth and health building opportunity that's here. And um, you know, we we just recently came across an elderly couple couple in the low income neighborhood of Sabrani Park, uh, African American couple, elderly. Um, living on a fixed income and you know in an old Victorian house, like so many of the houses in Oakland, an old Victorian house, and they were paying three hundred dollars a month for their energy bill and could you know cracked windows uh, can 't afford to pay for the upfront cost of a weatherization and an energy retrofit that in fact would bring their energy bill down to the point where it would pay for itself in a short period of time. Um, those are the kinds of solutions we want to fast track. Uh, the kinds of solutions that are obvious, that pay for themselves, that reduce greenhouse gas emissions, that create jobs, and that make people's lives more comfortable and and um, and healthier. So, um, you know, that that's the kind of thing that we're fighting for. I think that when it comes to transportation and land use, we really want to change the way that people move around, um, get people out of their cars and, and uh, walking more and, and biking more and using public transit more. And uh, those are really big decisions. Those are long-term decisions. Those are regional decisions that we all want to collaborate together to build. So I I hope that's a little more specific. Uh, Dana, do you have anything to add to that? Just that this is also a great opportunity for the city to... um, to kind of think differently about the way that it's engaging um, it's the community of Oakland um, around these really important decisions. Um, the Oakland Climate Action Coalition is um, really proposing that the city launch a public engagement campaign that targets the Oakland flatlands. Um, so these are the areas that Ian was referring, for, referring to as kind of the most vulnerable to sea level rise and other forms of uh, natural disasters. Um, these low-income communities um, and communities of color are the most impacted um, by these environmental hazards and are often um, traditionally left out of the planning processes for really um, kind of landmark decisions such as these. Um, so we're hoping that community engagement campaigns will be conducted um, with full participation from um, organizations that are involved in the coalition and also new organizations um, and efforts that um, want to get involved in kind of um, this climate uh, justice um, movement in Oakland. Um, I know that our youth um, have been super excited about these new experiences that they've been having over the last several months. So, um, you know, it's really amazing for, you know, young women to kind of be in the same space where we're ta- where they're talking about the same issues with um, union members, um, with elderly people, with um, business owners, um, and with um, people much older than themselves. And, you know, oftentimes they joke that they get really nervous talking to strangers or being in a room where they don't know people. Um, But this issue has really brought a lot of people together. Mm -hmm. And um, when we see young people kind of um, with confidence about what they want um, for this issue of climate change, um, when we see, when we have more spaces where they get a chance to um, be together and and kind of demonstrate some unity um, with folks from other communities um, and that live different lives. Um, I think it gives me a lot of hope for kind of what the city can become and how the how, how this can be an issue that really unites all parts of Oakland. Um, so I hope that there's going to be a lot more um, opportunities um, that the city um, directs f- um, for the for various communities to come together. 
Mm -hmm. And I would just flag for just in, uh, listeners who from who are residents of Oakland who are interested in getting involved in this process to um, just keep ears and eyes out for any community engagement opportunities that come up this year. Because if the plan um, the plan does include these these engagement strategies, then um, there's actually a way for our voice to be heard. And the first way that you can do that is this Tuesday's rally, um, which the Clim Oakland Climate Action Coalition is hosting, and that's in front of City Hall at 4.30 p.m. Again, um, music, um, there's going to be a DJ performance, and also just really amazing speakers on stage. And that's outside um, of City Hall again. There's also... Um, Oh, that the date is March 30th. And also coming up before Tuesday even, we have some community workshops that are happening all over Oakland. And I'm just going to quickly shout those out in case anybody is interested in joining. Um, so there's actually one tonight that's happening um, at uh, in the Fruitvale area. And that's at the Mujeres Unidas and Activas uh, office at um, 2783 East 12th Street. So if uh, you're listening and want to shoot over right after the show, <laughs> feel free to. Um, in East Oakland, there's a workshop by the Tassa Faranga Recreation Center at 975 85th Avenue. Again, that's 975 85th Avenue, and that's on Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. You can also go in West Oakland to a workshop um, at 1747 14th Street, and that is at the West Oakland Environmental Indicators Project. That's going to be on Monday from 6 to 8 p.m. And also on Monday from 4 to 6 p.m., there's a special workshop for youth, which is a teach-in um, in Oakland at the Asian Communities for Reproductive Justice Office. Um, at 1440 Broadway. So those are some workshops that you can uh, check out. We have that information and more at ellabakercenter.org. And we have to wrap up now our interview. First, I just want to thank Ian and Dana for coming out today. Thanks, Alan. Um, thank you. Yeah, don't forget to join us on Tuesday, um, 4.30 p.m. City Hall. And so I'm just going to go ahead and introduce, we have a, another segment coming up here at Apex. Um, the second half of tonight's show is with Annabelle Udo O'Malley, Matthew Abaya, and DJ Bretta Kay. And they're bringing us a tribute to Lonnie Ding and select reviews and films from the San Francisco International Film Festival. So many times, cause I don't want to see you cry. But if you say, oh, then I'll stay. Cause we go through this every day. You know that I got some love. And when the push comes to shove, cause you don't want to wait. And I don't want to wait. But we don't ever communicate. Cause it's only love if you want to be in my shower. Oh, tell us with some old English for days Cause I don't want just anybody Together with the life of the party So here's my New Year's resolution To clear up any obvious confusion Cause I'm just hoping that you understand When I wanna be your man Don't you see me, girl, I'm trying to oh, 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 oh. And inside I'm slowly dying oh, Who's gonna justify That love for you and I Cause girl, when I decide to give you Well yes, it and all my love oh, oh. If you wanna be in my shower day Or towels with some old English boys Cause I don't want just anybody Together with the life of the party So here's my New Year's resolution To clear up any obvious confusion Cause I'm just hoping that you understand But now I wanna be your man Can't you tell that I'm not lying Love, wipe your tears when you start crying Well, if 
you wanna be in my show day Or toast with some old English for days Cause I don't want just anybody Together with the life of the party Sounds of natural vibrations. Band from Hawaii that's going to be playing tomorrow, Friday, March 26th, at the place called The Rocket Room in San Francisco. Natural vibrations from Hawaii. We've got tickets to give away to the first callers at 510-848-4425 who can tell us where Natural Vibrations is from. The Rocket Room is strictly 21 and over. The show is tomorrow night. And the Rocket Room is located at the location of the Old Last Day Saloon, which is Clement Street in the Richmond District of San Francisco. Clement at Fifth Avenue. Yeah, you tuned in to Apex Express on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. Yeah, your Asian Pacific Islander community program. Up next... We've got some special reviews from the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival. Janaka Selecta and Vishal Kanwa Remix. I'd like to thank Janaka Selecta for giving us this music. If you'd like to hear more and if you'd like to find out about his live gigs, you can check out Worldly. Google it, Worldly. Janaka is spelled J A N A K A. Selecta, S-E-L-E-K-T-A, Janaka Selecta. Well, you know, when you're trying to talk about all the films that are featured at the Asian American Film Festival that happens every year in San Francisco in March and also happens in San Jose and Berkeley, there are too many things to talk about. In fact, NATA, as it used to be called, but now CAM, the Center for Asian American Media, is actually turning 30. So like in their uh, special promos that they would show at the beginning of the film showings, trying to cram 30 years into 30 seconds is a tall order. But tonight, we're going to bring you some reviews of select films and point you toward where you can get more information. Yeah. But a K here on the mic, uh, one of the KPFA regular collective members. I host a show called Roots Communications, late night on Fridays, 2 a.m. And as part of the API Specials team that brings you the Indo-Pacific Edge in May and Radio Kalayaan on June 12th, Philippine Independence Day, I'm glad to be back here as one of the contributing producers for Apex Express. I want to say maximum respect and loving memory for Sister Jenna Hota. Tonight we'll also do a brief tribute to Lani Ding. So let's launch right into the reviews of the films from the San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival. This is Matthew Baya, filmmaker and youth media educator. I'll be reviewing some films from the 2010 San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival. Nenoi Kino and The Rise of People Power by Tom Kaufman. Manila in the Claw of Neon as a part of legendary Philippine filmmaker 
Lino Broca's retrospective, and the Taiwanese romantic comedy of Wa Taipei by Arvin Chan. My name is Annabelle Udo O'Malley. I'm a freelance arts and entertainment writer based in San Francisco. The quick pick films I'll be reviewing from this year's San Francisco International Asian American Film Festival will be David Kaplan's Today's Special, Brent Onbay's Ajima Are You Crazy, and Curtis Choi's Manila Town is in the Heart, Time Travels with Al Robles. Speaking to my students, I want to express my respect for them. I want to say to them, each time you speak truth to power, I honor you. Each time you take a risk for the sake of your ideals and fall, I honor you. Each time you rise to act again, I honor you. That was a segment posted on YouTube of media pioneer Lonnie Ding speaking at Stony Brook University. In 2002, upon receiving an honorary doctorate, she passed away last month. A media activist can be defined as someone who is committed to a cause and uses a selected form of media which best translates that consciousness to create social movement. This was Lonnie Ding, media activist, visionary, veteran independent filmmaker, TV producer, policymaker, and much more. Christopher Chow, one of the first Asian American reporters in the country, phrases it well. Lonnie Ding was an Asian American pioneer in journalism, though she was not known as a journalist, he said. She had the eyes, ears, and instincts of a journalist. She knew everybody had a story to tell and how to get it out of them. She pioneered in giving people from the community the means of production to tell their stories. For myself, I never had the opportunity to meet Lonnie Ding in person, but I did fortunately have a chance to interview her by phone in 2007. I was writing a short piece on the transformation and history of then the National Asian American Telecommunications Association, or NATA, which Lonnie tirelessly helped establish in 1980, now the Center for Asian American Media. I spoke with such other pioneer filmmakers, such as Spencer Nakasako, Eric Byler, and Emiko Omori, and asking for more information, they all said, oh yeah, talk to Lonnie Ding. You have to talk to Lonnie Ding. Enter Lonnie Ding. She talked to me over the phone as if I were kneeling at her feet, listening. She was a treasure trove of information, talking shop about Nata's inaugural festival in 1982, which was a humble three-night showcase at the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley. She told me about how they featured the premiere of Chan is Missing by a then-unknown filmmaker named Wayne Wang. She told me about the 80s and how socially committed documentaries were being produced by Asian Americans. She talked to me about her explorations with the public broadcasting service and the lack of representation of Asian American voices. I was at awe. I managed to finish that piece, but, well, my computer was my notes when that dialogue crashed about a year after that interview. But her words still resonate with me, inspired me to be part of her social movement. And the annual San Francisco International Asian American Film Festivals are the continuum of Lonnie's breath. This is Annabelle Udo O'Malley, freelance writer and media activist. You're tuned in to Apex Express on KPFA or KPFB in Berkeley, KFCF in Fresno. There is an allegorical painting called The Vinegar Tasters, which shows the three founders of China's renowned philosophers, Confucius, Buddha, and Lao Tzu, each dipping his finger in a vat of vinegar, each with individual expressions on his face that offers three different perspectives on life. And so comes in what was this year's opening night film at the San Francisco International Film Festival. Today's special stars Asif Mandi of The Daily Show, playing Samir, the protagonist chef, who crosses paths with a cab driver, Akbar, and allows Samir to find his flavor in the garam masala of life. Through the brilliant direction of David Kaplan, this film, which takes place in New York, is a breath of fresh air when it comes to addressing the South Asian immigrant experience in America and serves up several LOL moments on a plate and flavorful doses of food as a metaphor of life's lessons. Fans of renowned world veggie cuisine chef and veteran actress Madhur Jaffrey will absolutely love her role as Samir's mother, who unleashes her charm on the big screen without ever picking up a knife to chop garlic or onions. 
running at 99 minutes, Kaplan strikes a fine balance by piecing together a film that keeps the audience engaged with the right concoction of suspense, romance, comedy, and philosophy. For more information about this film, visit www.todaysspecial.com. Lessons of the Blood. In history, there is a chapter leading up to World War II as far as the United States' involvement where the Japanese invaded the Asian mainland, Manchuria, and attacked the Chinese nationalist government in Nanking or Nanjing. The crimes in that attack by the Japanese Imperial Army are referred to in the film Lessons of the Blood. You heard music from that particular film, which premiered at the Asian American Film Festival. Up now, one of our real national anthems from the Philippines, Ang Bayan Ko. Tut bulaklak, pag-ibig ko sa kanyang palad, nag-alay na ganda nila at sa kanyang yumi at ganda, dayuhan ay nahalina. Ninoy Aquino and the Rise of People Power by Tom Kaufman. A lot could be said about the film that could stir debate about the assassinated Filipino resistance leader Ninoy Aquino. Regardless of your opinion about the Aquino family, the documentary is an interesting portrait of the man behind the fall of the Marcos regime. When I think about Ninoy Aquino, the first image that comes to my mind is a gory photo of his wife paying her last respects to her assassinated husband. His body is still bloodied in the same clothes he's wearing at the time of his murder. The film takes us on a journey of a Filipino brought up in an upper middle class family, suddenly becoming more in tune with the struggles of his countrymen. His actions to speak out and organize eventually lead to years of imprisonment. I knew little of him before this film, only that his murder led to an uprising of the people and the fall of the Marcoses. His wife, Corazon, would succeed him as the president of the Philippines. Most who I've seen who attended this film seem to be very moved by Aquino's sacrifice, as was I. However, I was left with an uncertain feeling that this was not the full story. The filmmaker cites the movie Gandhi as an inspiration to the noise sacrifice. This reference drew a slight chuckle from the audience. I wasn't sure if this was life imitating art or the other way around. Regardless, it's still interesting to finally see footage of Ninoy talking in opposed to his wife Corazon, who often gets more attention for the resistance. I hope that people do not see this as the only film to measure martial law in the Philippines. 
things featured at the Asian American Film Festival this year, hosted by the Center for Asian American Media, was a retrospective of the great Filipino director Lino Broca's films, including the film Bayan Ko, of the same title as that song that we heard there. In the background, it also sung by Asin before Matteo Baez's review of Nino Aquino. But Broca's films were not necessarily pro-government. In fact, his film Ora Pro Nobis, or Fight for Us, criticized the Aquino regime. And Tinimbang. Manila in the Claw of Neon by is, Lino Broca. I was most excited here. to check out the retrospective on Lino Broca. Being that I identify with being a Filipino filmmaker, I felt it was my duty to be familiar with his works. I managed to check out 1974's Manila in the Claw of Neon at the Pacific Film Archive in Berkeley. I was surprised by the condition of the film, a badly faded 16mm print with scratched up optical tracks. I understand that these prints are rare, but at some point, I hope the world film community will see the importance of restoring these works. In spite of the obvious damage over the years, his bleak revolutionary message is still clear maybe even too clear for my modern sensibilities. When you are trying to make a point about the evils in the world, nothing can be subtle. We follow a country boy as he faces the harshness of the big city. Many evils await in the Manila where he attempts to search for his missing love who disappeared in the hopes of making a better life there in the city. His journey to find his lost love takes him on an ever bleaker journey of harsh labor, prostitution and murder. The main plot seems to be echoed in more recent films like Slumdog Millionaire. The only thing I can tell you about this film for sure, without ruining anything, is that you're not going to be expecting a happy ending, which is true to Broca's form. Al Robles passed away last year. It was a huge loss to the Asian American community. He was a master jazz poet, Guardian to the downtrodden, Manong of Manongs, cool cat, enigmatic, yet omnipresent. Manila Town is in the heart, time travels with Al Robles, is an endearing snapshot into his world. Nothing scripted, just Al moving about. Sort of a reality showpiece that captures the essence of Al's whimsical and compassionate nature. Of his meandering through cramped doorways of dimly lit hotels, to talk to Filipino vets, who would suspiciously answer his knock from the darkness of their rooms. Or perhaps it would be Al, who would mysteriously appear on the bus when you thought you had just seen him several blocks away. I love the raw simplicity of this film and Curtis Choi's documentation of Al's documentation. I would recommend this film as a primer to anyone who wants to get a glimpse into the life of a giving, passionate person who didn't waste time with fodder. If anything, it's a lasting documentation of his legacy. But Manila Town is in the heart. You can actually check out manilatown.org or Chunk Moon Hunter Productions. You tuned into Apex Express, Asian Pacific Community Radio on KPFA. Sounds here from the film State of Aloha. Another film that is certainly worth checking out. A great documentary about the uh, issues around declaring statehood for Hawaii. Other films that uh, I got to see which were certainly worthwhile were Agrarian Utopia about peasant farmers in Thailand and the, an art house take on the Philippine-American war called Independencia. Hi, 
I need a break from all the dark films that seem to draw me into an existential funk. So I was treated to Au Revoir Taipei by Arvin Chan. Art imitating life or life imitating, well, I'm not sure what order it goes here either, but at least I know it was an escape from reality. A young man's quest to go to Paris to reunite with his girlfriend is offset by wannabe mobsters and crazy hijinks. Great ensemble of characters and a believable romance between the two stars, not even a single kiss between the two. Funny parallels with real world versus the silly, violent soap operas frequently watched by the average Taipei residents. The film set in the streets of Taipei paint a gorgeous portrait of a city. It truly makes me want to visit and try the food of the many vendors there. Au revoir Taipei by Arvin Chan. Stars, why also say a boulder? Oh, Michael! I know. Oh, and look at all the posters. Lovers embrace. Which mama? Now you're cooking. Yes, you I'm Michael fans, I see. Yes, did you know he speaks great English on a YouTube video at work? And Michael's actually part Caucasian. To Korea when he was three years old. And his real name is Michael Park. He Koreanized it to Park when he started acting. Fans are called Parkies. We're Parkies. Wow, super fans. You're like a walking cage on my database. Yes, and we read that you're co-sponsoring Michael Park's visit, and we wanted to know how we can meet him. Oh, sorry. That information isn't public. Daniel? Ooh, you know what you remind me of? Kimchi. Because you're hot like kimchi. So extra spicy. Yeah. <laughs> There once was a day when cougars were animals depicted on Wild Kingdom, but has since gone out like the rotary telephone and evolved into defining women who, say, enjoy dipping into the fountain of youth. Ajima is a Korean term that refers to middle-aged women. And in Ajima, Are You Crazy? A short film by Hawaii-based director Brent Anbe brings to life an absolutely hilarious snippet into the world of a triple threat of Ajumas who are fixated on a nubile Korean superstar named Michael Park, portrayed by Michael Shaw. This zany comedy encompasses the hysteria surrounding the K-drama phenomenon and introduces the frenetic, wide-eyed romantic obsession of Judy, who masterminds her celebrity stalking with finesse. At the whim of their friend's idolatrous behavior, Susan and Amy become just as guilty in their pursuit to meet their six-packed golden boy. The plot thickens. Enter the Paris Hilton archetypes, a Bermuda triangle of high-heeled, high-maintenance girls known as the Inner Girls, led by sexy Sheena, armed and dangerous with cat claws, and I'm all that attitude only fuels the Ajuma fire to succeed. With 100 laughs per minute, me thinks it would be a savvy move for Anbe to consider Ajuma as a full feature or maybe a sitcom perhaps. The movie's charming, quick-tongued, madcap characters leaves us wanting our own Ajuma night out. For more information, visit www.ajummamovie.com. Well, that's it for this time on Apex Express. If you'd like more info about any of the films that we reviewed, you can check out asianamericanmedia.org and go to the festival website, which is still active, and you can actually click on individual films and get contact information. Tune in to the API specials in May and in June as well. You can find us on Facebook by going to KPFA API Radio Specials. I'd like to say thank you for listening and thank you also uh, for uh, tuning us in online if you're doing that. You can find more info about us at apexexpress.org. Thanks to Eric Klein, Gloria Lowe, and Carl for board hopping. 